Hello everyone, my name is Ben Appleby, and today I'm going to talk to you about the SAMNAC uh, Research Lab. As a quick overview, our lab is a soft matter and interfaces lab, and predominantly our tools that we use is uh, rheology and also uh, material science. So rheology is really just the fluid mechanics of complex materials and better understanding how those material properties of these complex uh, fluids then relate to their applications in flow and also uh, dynamic and even uh, static uh, movement and properties. So some of the materials that we use include um, hydrogels, biomass, um, drilling muds, and then we also use um, surfactants and colloidal and platelet-like particles at uh, interfaces. So just jumping right into our research topics, our research projects. We first have um, biomass and rheology and kinetics. So this project is um, Jess Troxler's um, project. She is a second year PhD student. And now I will go through um, her blurb on the project. <clears throat> so biomass products are a promising renewable energy resource that can be used in combustion engines. So biomass is treated at high temperatures in, in their atmosphere to produce crude bio oil in a process called pyrolysis. So pyrolysis reactions occur in three main stages, as shown in the first figure. Biomass undergoes uh, decomposition reactions, cracking and condensation of the bio oil vapors, repolymerization and um, repolymerization of the char, bio oil, and also gases. So pyrolysis is categorized by heating rates and residence times. Um, Ardor feeders are the most common uh, feeding system in the industry uh, used for um, biomass. And the reason why is because they provide a constant flow of biomass and um, due to um, their screw conveyor um, like setup, um, it can be pressurized and it gives a means of controlling the pressure uh, within your bio or within your pyrolysis uh, reactor. So in figure three, um, biomass is going to enter at Z equals zero into the auger feeder and the rotating screw is gonna move the bio biomass to um, Z equals L, which is the end of the feeder um, that is then connected to the pyrolysis reactor. So outside of the auger, auger there is also a cooling loop um, parallel to the biomass that flows parallel to the biomass to prevent heating that would cause a reaction prematurely. So biomass feedstock and uh, the feed itself plays a broad, large role in biofuel yields uh, with the idea that higher concentrations of biomass are ideal because they have higher energy densities uh, for processing. But at the same time, at those higher biomass concentrations, it becomes far more challenging uh, to process and move about at an ind industrial scale. So the working hypothesis is that heat transfer from the pyrolysis reactor causes preliminary decomposition reactions in the feeder as shown by the red arrow in figure three. This reaction changes the rheology of the biomass, causing it to be sticky. However, little is really known about the relationship between pyrolysis kinetics and biomass uh, rheology. So the goal of this project is to model heat transfer, pyrolysis, pyrolysis reaction kinetics, and biomass rheology within the auger feeder system using Python. Figure two shows one dimensional uh, temperature profile within the auger feeder. The end of the auger is heated by the reactor and the heat travels down the steel auger from Z equals L to Z equals zero via conduction. The biomass is heated through contact with auger and heat transfer occurs via conduction and also convection. The intercooling loop flows countercurrent in an annulus around the biomass pulling heat from the biomass. Heat transfer in the cooling jacket proceeds via conduction and convection. Using the temperature profile of biomass, a heating rate will be established. The heating rate can also be calculated using kinetic rate constants within the auger feeder. A kinetic model will be employed to determine what intermediate or final products are being formed within the auger feeder. Biomass flow will be modeled using the discrete element method so that it's possible to track changes in individual biomass particles along the feeder. These results will be compared with experimental measurements of the composition and rheology of the biomass at varying lengths along the auger feeder. With this information, we can understand the relationship between pyrolysis kinetics and biomass rheology within the auger feeder. Once this relationship is understood, it will be possible to optimize the system to prevent the occurrence of preliminary pyrolysis reactions that cause the biomass to become sticky um, within the auger feeder. Okay, so that uh, wraps up uh, Jess's section. Now we're gonna move on to 2D materials and atomically thin films. This is the work of David Goggins, and he is a fifth year PhD student that is on his way out. So this could be a potential project in the future for new students. 
So going into um, his blurb. So another project in the Samanic lab has dealt with understanding the dynamics of 2D materials at fluid-fluid interfaces. 2D materials such as graphene, hexagonal boron nitride, and molybdenum disulfide have gained interest over the past decade because of the unique properties that arise in these materials since their thickness is at the atomic scale. They are also of interest to our group because of their platelet-like structure, where their lateral dimensions are much greater than their atomic scale thicknesses. We are interested in putting these particles at flat fluid-fluid interfaces as shown in figure five. Because fluid interfaces can irreversibly trap particles and combine them to only interact in two dimensions, which promotes lateral interactions and the formation of thin films with homogeneous thicknesses. We can also deposit, uh, we can also then deposit um, films created at fluid fluid interfaces onto arbitrary substrates such as glass or flexible polymers, which could then be used in next generation devices. However, in order to create reproducible films, we first have to understand that forces that give rise to directed or self assembly of these particles into a specific film structure at a fluid interface. So in figure six and figure seven, some of the progress that, has, that we have made in understanding the interactions and other parameters that govern the structure of graphene particles, films, at an air-water interface. So figure 6a shows a time lapse of three graphene particles that undergo reversible attachment and detachment processes over a time scale of about 12 seconds. This is unique to 2D particles at a fluid interface, as most interactions between other types of particles, such as spherical particles, are strong and irreversible. We can begin to try to understand why these particles are able to attach and detach by looking at the pair interaction potentials that govern the strength of attraction between two particles, shown in figure 6b and 6c. We can see in the green curves that if the particle are able to align themselves in the ideal orientation, they experience a weak but continuous attraction towards one another. But if they become misaligned, then they have begin to experience repulsion from one another at very close distances, seen by the purple and red curves in figures 6b and c. So by examining the interaction potential, we are able to determine that the magnitude of attraction interactions were weak and it could be balanced and by thermal energy or Brownian motion. Finally, in figure seven shows some recent progress we have made in creating size and shape controlled graphene particles. And we are beginning to understand how shape influences the order of these systems. So in parts A through C, you're looking at 25 micron triangles, 50 micron discs, and 25 micron squares. And in part D, we're plotting the global bond orientational order parameter on the y-axis as a function of area fraction that the particles take up in each image on the x-axis. This bond orientational order parameter is really just a measure of the extent of total order within the image where a value of one implies that all particles are aligned perfectly to take up space in the image and a value of zero implies that all particles are completely randomly oriented in the image. This can be easily seen in part C where we see that the squares are packed together very nicely so we see that a value for fourfold order, the red square, is now becoming significant. Without getting into too much detail, the main purpose for analyzing the images in A, B, and C in this way was so that we could compare the results to previous simulation studies. The results from this work suggest that particle shape does in fact influence the structure due to an increased rotational and translational entropy for every particle when all particles are optimally aligned. I hope this gave you a brief um, introduction to another project currently underway in the SANRAC lab. And if you have any further questions, don't be afraid to contact David and please ensure, enjoy your virtual visit uh, to Minds. So with that, um, please feel free to contact any of us if you have any more questions related to the lab or specific projects. And whoever your point of contact is for Minds will also be happy to provide those emails. So moving on to the next presentation is particle tracking microbiology. So this is Shalaka Khaled's um, presentation. And she is also a fifth year PhD student in the SAMNEC lab. And this might be a potential project in the future, but ultimately Astra, if you have questions or are curious about potential projects. So going into her presentation, microbiology can be used to characterize variations in mechanical properties of materials at micron and submicron length scales. One of the most common approaches is to use particle tracking microbiology or colloidal trace particles placed in, inter, in the interest of material and its motion is tracked via video microscopy to extract all the modulus of the material. There are two types in my particle tracking microbiology. First is passive particle tracking microbiology. Red tracer is randomly driven by inherent thermal fluctuations of the solvent molecules with energy KT resulting in its Brownian motion. This random Brownian motion is tracked and converted to mean square displacement or MSD 
um, data as a function of lag time. And this can be correlated using the Stokes-Einstein equation as shown um, on the page. So this equation correlates tracer displacement to the medium's rheological properties. For a viscous medium, the equation shows that the particle displacement is inversely proportional to the viscosity eta and linearly pro proportional to the lag time. The figure um, eight shows that the passive means MSD of a single tracer particle and viscous or Newtonian fluids. Um, we see that for relatively lower viscosity, the MSD curve has a linear slope. For, for relatively high viscous fluids, this place may become small enough that it cannot be detected with the maximum tracking resolution of a typical microscope. Thus, as seen in the figure, as the viscosity increases, the MSD slope becomes nonlinear, tends to zero. The tracking re resolution therefore puts a limit on maximum measurable viscosity. To overcome this limitation, one can use a second type of particle uh, tracking microreology, named as active. Uh, microbiology. Here the tracer particle is driven by exter external forces like magnetic or optical forces. In this work, we use active microbiology to uniquely agitate the tracer, tracer particle in a random motion similar to Brownian fluctuation, but with greater energies higher than Kt, as if you're increasing the temperature. The main advantage of this approach over traditional active microbiological methods is that the induced random motion of the particle uh, allows one to use hydrodynamic models to obtain material functions without needing knowledge of a defined strain field, a major hurdle in microbiology of interfacial systems and in complex biological systems. To achieve this, we have developed a form of active microbiology using electromagnetic tweezers that induce an artificial thermal noise on a superparamagnetic particle in the form of a white noise signal as shown in the inset of uh, figure nine. The magnetic tracer particle is randomly pulled on either side by the electromagnets, thus inducing a 1D random motion. The resulting active MSD as shown in figure 10 um, as the medium is viscous, the active MSD still has a slope of one, but the MSD magnitude is higher than the passive MSD of the same fluid. This indicates that the tracer experiences higher energy KT um, than higher energy KT. Future work involves expanding uh, this idea to locally pro viscoelastic environments. So that wraps up uh, the Schlaka section. And moving on to the final section is my work, which is in plugging porous media flow. Um, so jumping right into it, um, my work is uh, applied to underground tunneling with the idea that um, underground tunneling setups are essentially drill rigs that are good at um, drilling long underground tunnels at um, great depths. So the advantage of this is that it gives a means of protecting sensitive environments without needing to um, fully uh, dig up or uh, trench um, through your material um, at the surface level. So instead, you just simply dig a tunnel, go underneath, um, whatever obstacle, um, providing a uh, easier uh, method of creating tunnels. So this is also great for urban environments and even uh, military use as well. So the major um, problem uh, related to this is that underground tunneling is relatively slow. So the goal, overall goal of my project is to increase the speed of underground tunneling. But this comes with uh, a couple of inherent challenges specific that's gonna be uh, specific to soft matter and as it relates to us, because um, how underground tunneling works is that drilling fluids are um, pumped along to power a cutter head that cuts up soil material. And at the same time, it carries these soil cuttings out of the tunnel. But one of the major problems that results from um, tunneling faster is fluid loss. And fluid loss is the idea that um, um, drilling fluid is leaking or flowing into the formation. When this happens, then that drilling fluid is no longer uh, removing soil cuttings from the cutter, flay, cutter face, and it can also result in increased friction that um, may get the drill rig uh, stuck within the tunnel, making it unrecoverable. So two uh, means of fluid loss are present. So one of them is if you're drilling faster, you're gonna be drilling at um, higher fluid pressures. But if fluid pressures are too high, it can either match um, the strength of the soil formation and then exceed it, resulting in fracture and fluid loss. Or alternatively, um, you could encounter um, porous media such as gravels, boulders, or even coarse sands that can also result in fluid loss. But the problem of high pressure is, is going to be mitigated by uh, desurgated pumps all along the drill rig so that you don't experience high um, local high uh, drilling pressures. But the problem with porous media like gravel in the sands is less easily addressed. And that will be the major focus of uh, my project. 
So the objective of my project is how can we better understand flu loss to porous media so that we can then prevent it from happening and then continue drilling. So how we're going to address this or mimic it is with a permeation cell. So as seen in figure 12a, we have, uh, we're building uh, essentially an acrylic pipe that you can fill with porous media and then pump drilling fluid through it and better investigate the events of um, flu loss to porous media. So as seen in figure 11, the system works by um, using a tank filled with drilling mud that's then pre pressurized and flows into a permeation cell as indicated by uh, number 11. So the permeation cell is the acrylic pipe that's filled with the porous media uh, material and um, pressure drop will be measured um, along this permeation cell and also uh, flow rate. So with these um, two parameters and also knowing the permeability and porosity of your material, then you can use uh, theory to better um, understand the sort of transient behavior of flow through this material and then also ultimately um, plugging of uh, your porous media. So at the end of the day, we'll be using our knowledge of suspension rheology of the soft, soft matter, um, which is um, drilling mud, and then seeing how we can use that and understanding um, those material properties, um, uh, better plug or control plugging within porous media so that we can continue um, tunneling and not lose fluid um, to the formation. And also uh, a hole that we will fill within this area is the idea of solids content, because as you're drilling, you're gonna have drilling fluids and it's also gonna be carrying uh, soils cuttings. So how do soil cuttings then relate to the idea of plugging in these porous uh, formations? Um, this will be dependent on fluid rheology and then also on um, the flow regime. So in summary, um, that wraps up our uh, group and we would all be happy to answer any questions that you have and I will be at the live Q&A session in the future if you have questions, but looking forward to meeting you uh, in the future. Take care.